So I'm using my 40th, upcoming 40th birthday as a way to highlight the work that I'm... I was going to ask you that. To highlight um, <laughs> the, the work that I've been doing outside of the gallery too. Um, in conjunction with my solo show, which is called Enough to Fly Solo, is a group exhibition that I joined about abstract art um, with three other artists. Because I'm not going to talk to myself, my younger sister, Akila Laster, will be interviewing everyone. And so this is my first time, or second time, letting someone else moderate this. So I hope you. <laughs> okay, and so again. <laughs> Thanks for coming, and then we'll let her take over. Do you want to introduce the artist? Um, in conjunction with this solo show, um, there are three other artists in the group show. Um, on Zoom is Chuck Johnson from Memphis, Tennessee. Um, from Milwaukee, who could not stay because she had oral surgery yesterday, is Nina uh, Gambarzada. And then from Puerto Rico is Pedro Velez. He's still in Puerto Rico. Um, he wasn't able to join the Zoom, um, but the works are on display, and then if you have any questions for them, we can talk to Chuck now, and I can relay messages to the other artists. All right. All right, so you mentioned the titles of both shows. Let's start with your solo show, Enough to Fly Solo. What is the meaning behind that? <laughs> So initially, it was just going to be called enough, and it was like a question mark behind it. Like, is this enough? Am I doing enough? Is the work good enough? And so I decided just to add um, two fly solo, like enough to carry myself alone. And then I added the extra O to the two, just be dramatic. Like, is this fly? Like, this is going to be some fly shit. And so, um, <laughs> so that's behind that title. And then for the group abstraction show, um, a lot of the people are not comfortable with abstraction because they're sometimes hidden messages um, within the works, um, within their marks. And so um, it's called If Only You Knew, and it was based off a of Patti LaBelle song, like if you knew the extra meanings behind um, the gestures and colors and messages in the pieces. So that's how that came about. All right. Um, I'm going to go to Chuck. Chuck, thank you for joining us from Memphis. Uh, my first question for you is, how did you decide on the grid system for your abstract pieces? And are these, are these places in your um, work, are these specific places that you chose, or is it completely arbitrary? That's a good question. Ever since I've been doing abstractions, I've always lay down a grid first. I have no idea ahead of time what the painting is going to be, but if I lay down a grid, uh, to me that is a jumping off point. You know, I'm, I'm an ex-military. I love maps. I love the, uh, to look at maps. I love looking at contour lines and, and the little signals and everything on maps. Uh, if you look at the layout of streets and, uh, and seas and all, they're all pretty much laid out on a grid system. So every time I start a painting, I always start out using the grid system. Uh, what was the second part of that question? I, okay, so I asked if, there, if the grids were from specific places, like are there specific locations that, these, uh, that you were inspired by, or is it just um, arbitrary? Well, you know, I, um, you know, I, I, I like, I'm, I've always been interested in uh, ley lines and 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 and, and architectural sites uh, that are supposed to have spiritual connections, and if you connect them, um, you know, they're called ley lines, and I've always been interested in ley lines. So a lot of my paintings are based on ley lines. You know, I love using the grid and also lines to kind of connect the the, the, the pieces. Um, yeah. Okay. You mentioned the um, lay points. Um, can you explain if there's any spiritual or supernatural experience that you want um, people to feel when they see your works? 
Well, I just want people to be moved by them. You know, I want, you know, them to wonder, you know, why, why use this, why I use that. You know, oftentimes I have no idea. So I love using strong geometric shapes. You know, everybody can connect with those, but, uh, you know, I just want people to just kind of experience different things by looking at the pieces. Got you. Okay. And your use of color is very beautiful, which I know is not an artistic term. But um, when you start, are you uh, using color right away or do you decide um, what's your approach to color choices? Uh, color. First rule of thumb is never use a color straight out of the tube. Never, ever use a color straight out of the tube. And my one of my favorite colors to use is a color called Payne's Gray. I put Payne's Gray in every single color I use, um, even white. And for some reason, if I put Payne's Gray in every color, that somehow pulls the painting together. And I also believe in, if I'm gonna be using a yellow color and the brush that I used before maybe had green in it, oftentimes I won't clean the brush up. I'll just go ahead and mix that yellow with the same green brush. And um, it makes for a, a different palette. And like I said, paint's great. It pulls every single thing, all the colors together, all of them together. Uh, and certain colors, I guess, I gravitate toward because if you look at all of my paintings, they all seem to kind of flow, and that's what I want. If you look around the studio, all the colors, all the paintings, you know, they seem to kind of mesh and flow together. And I, in my opinion, it's because the fact that I like to use paints gray in all of my colors, you know. That's about the best way I can explain it. Thank you. Um, I'll circle back to you in a bit, but I'm going to ask Fatima a couple questions. Fatima, um, you have a plethora of work over here in, in your solo show, but you also have some in your, the uh, was it collaborative show. They all give me different energy. Talk about the poppies and then your most recent work uh, for this show and the abstraction pieces. So the works in the solo show, the solo show is treated as a retrospective, so it's to show um, a progression. So the poppies are actually my very, very first professional painting. The first one is like the orange and purple one with the stripes. It originally was done in 2010, so that's when I always credit myself as starting as a professional artist. And then I added stripes to it three years later. So the date reflects that. But um, it was just me just jumping into it without any formal training, any concern or concepts about what the industry standards were. The poppy was the first flower I saw at the first property I bought. And I had never seen it before. I just thought it was a pretty flower. So I took a picture of it and then I made, rendered it as a painting. And so that's the history of the poppies. The colors on the one, um, grouping, um, I had it in Aloft Hotel years ago, and I made three additional ones to match their decor, hoping that they would buy all the pieces that they said their customers liked. They didn't, so I took it out right away. And then I made, <laughs> and then I made other renditions that are called um, self-portraits, because I have the colors I read and teal, which I claim are my like spiritual colors, the hot and cold, or hot and water, and so um, those are behind the poppies. And then I just graduated into more abstraction because that's more of where my work leans toward. And I started ex experimenting with plaster, which I found in the basement, not knowing how like these other artists were creating like the heavy body texture pieces that I saw and, and liked. And um, so let me ask you um, about Magnolia's return specifically in the abstract show. in the abstract show. What prompted that? Everybody um, might not know Magnolia is our grandmother's name, our maternal grandmother's name. So, so in the abstract show, the Magnolia's return is um, 
Magnolia's Return is about um, my grandmother. My grandmother's name was Magnolia. My love for flowers and gardening and nature came from her. And so it's like her, whenever I'm, you see me outside planting her garden, that's my way of communicating with her now that she's deceased. And so she's coming back to talk to us, her grandchildren, and try to spread her wisdom or her spirit now that she's gone. And so that's behind Magnolia's return. Um, the smaller one is called Magnolia's Return Short Stay because it's smaller. And when you would go visit her and if you would leave too soon, she said, with your little short stay, like why are you going so soon? And so that's behind the title of, and the concept of Magnolia's Return. Okay, thank you for sharing that personal story. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see if I can get her to open up a little more. My favorite works are um, Out of My Head. Those are the uh, white pieces, white and black pieces at the end. I was floored when I saw them. I'm like, oh, Fatima, you did that. I just, <laughs> I've been impressed with a lot of her work, but it, I've never seen that. So um, what was in your head when you created those that you needed to get out? <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so they're supposed to be like the horseshed psychology thing, so I just kind of let it flow. The first ones I did are actually these smaller pieces, which were done in 2016. I, I hadn't revisited the work until now, until 2024. And so I wanted to like dump everything out without having a true focus and to try to play with how the material told me to let it be um, manipulated. And so that's behind the concept of out of my head is not thinking so much about the exact message with like the gentrification pieces or the Piccanini pieces or even the, the like Magnolia's one like just let it go and flow and it'll tell me what it's supposed to be. There's no specific imagery. They are abstract pieces and it's about what you pull out as the viewer. I see myself in one of them so. <laughs> Just kidding. They are for sale. Um, <laughs> I'm going to uh, go back over to Chuck. Um, Chuck, what's it like um, doing a collaborative show uh, with other artists whom you never met before and trying to create a cohesive look with three different artists at different who have different uh, approaches, styles, experiences, and backgrounds? Well, you know, I, I, I'm I not familiar with the other artists. I know you, but I'm not familiar with the other works. I hope that my pieces will somehow gel with the other other artists. You know, uh, hopefully, maybe the, my use of color, maybe the shapes. But, you know, I just hope the pieces will gel together. I'm looking at uh, Fatima's pieces on the wall black and white and grays, you know, and tans will, 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 will work with everything, but I'm not familiar with the other artists' work. I hope that they all work together. So I'm the curator, so my job is to create the synergy, <laughs> not the artists. They're like, this is what it is. And so um, when I do a group show, this is to answer your question, I look for each artist to have their own distinct aesthetic or voice. And then um, when I'm installing, I figure out what balances, like it might be color, what breaks up the room so people will want to keep walking through the space to see more but also mainly it's like it's all abstraction right now but how are they telling their abstract story so it's not boring you've seen the same thing over and over again do you how do you put artists together for a group show the question was how do i put artists together for a group show um is interest in their work again distinctness in the work their availability and I also look for um, diversity and not in a generic form, but like with age, race, gender, what have you, geographical location, um, histories. Like Nina is Persian and her work is very graphical, um, different than Chuck's. Like his is very linear, but she has like these stars and then she has these hand woven um, Persian messages in her works. And so, again, no monotony. 
Thank you. Um, Chuck, I have another question for you about your, the titles of your work. Uh, several of them are named fragments, they're different numbers, um, sacred geog geometry and double Venus. Is there um, any message behind the titles or what goes behind the titles of your work? Uh, fragments, I like to make my own templates. You know, the shapes in my paintings, uh, I, I use cardboard or uh, some kind of poster board or something to make my own shapes. Fragments, that title came from the scraps. One day I decided I'm going to, instead of using the shape that I cut out, I'm going to use the scraps, the negative shapes. And that's how that, that series of paintings came about, fragments. That's how that came about. I was using, the instead of the positive shapes, the shape that I intended, I started using the negative shapes. And that's how that series came about. And I think I did about, oh, maybe about 16 or more paintings from that fragment series. Now, what was the other series? What were, what were some of the other series? Um, what were the other ones you asked about? Yeah, what were the other series you were asking about? The Double Venus and Sacred Geometry. Sacred geometry, sacred geometry. I decided in sacred geometry to just to break everything down instead of using these complicated shapes to use simple geometric shapes, triangles, circles, squares, rectangles, and all, overlapping those shapes and see what shapes I came up with. And I thought, you know, these are nice. These are so nice. They're so simple. They're almost sacred. And that's how I came up with the title Sacred Geometry. And I did maybe a 20 or so from that series. Did you want to talk about double Venus? Venus, um, there's a famous, uh, not prehistoric, uh, piece of sculpture called, uh, is it Venus of Willendorf? The nude woman, the, uh, uh, the uh, not prehistoric, but the old, old, old one of the oldest sculptures they found Venus of Villanoff. I think that's the name of it. And uh, I cut a shape out and it reminded me of that sculpture, so that's why I called it Venus Double Venus. You know, I just used it twice. Um, how many of those did I do? I did maybe six or eight of those paintings. Yeah, maybe six or eight of those paintings. So that's how that came about. Awesome, thank you. Thank you. Fatima, um, you have another work in the abstract show uh, called Can I Live? And that's a Jay-Z song. Don't know if that's what inspired you, but let's talk about that. It is inspired by that quote, um, but it was, Okay. That um, body of work is highlighting the black women who are getting put on these boards in these museums or these schools, and a lot of them are quitting right away, or one recently committed suicide um, at a university, not being able to cope with the unre unrealistic pressures with racism and, and sexism in life. Um, that are put upon them and so the black and white lines are like the systems whether it be the born system that they are in racially or like the overall structural systems that they are trying to get out of and transition to and still be alive and so you see a transition in their color they're more vibrant when they pass through these white and black lines like once they get into the the blue area and so again it's just um to honor them because i don't know if all or many of you know about when i curated the um triennial two years ago in madison um it was the same thing come in here make us look anti-racist but like throw you through the ringer and um, try to sacrifice your your integrity your credibility um and putting everybody's situations in jeopardy and so it's just like, you know, can we be, can we exist, can I live um, and flourish? And can we have our flowers while we're still alive? 
do you all want to question? Okay, um, we're gonna open it to questions from the audience. If anyone has questions for either of our two artists that are available today. Don't feel pressure. Don't feel pressure, I have plenty. The question was, if, did Fatima make her work um, before she saw the other people's work in the uh, abstract show or after? Was that the, yeah. My work came later because um, I had already been honeymooning these artists for the abstract show. Um, initially, this my solo show was going to take up the whole space, and then we pushed back the dates, and so um, I joined their show. <laughs> so, but these works came later. But the base of the works are actually really old. I had abandoned those canvases for uh, ten plus years, and so it was like a task to me to not be wasteful and like um, tackle those again and figure out a different way of providing a new narrative for them. I didn't like them for a long time because people said the work was cute and I didn't like my work being called cute. Um, and now I'm like, it can be cute, um, but it has a little, a little roughness to it. So it was me currently like doing all these different approaches that I've adopted over time. But their works came first. Their works did not influence my work, it was me reworking some old stuff that I had long abandoned. All right, do we have any up? What led you to art and what's your ultimate goal? <laughs> what led you to art and what's your ultimate goal? That could be for goal? Chuck, too. And that could be for you as well, Chuck. Do you want to answer first? Jesus. I've been an artist all my life. All my life. My parents used to tell me that when I was, like, three and four years old, I loved to draw on the walls. And most kids at that age, you know, they would throw a temper tantrum if they couldn't find a toy or couldn't find or this or that. I would throw a tantrum if I couldn't find a pencil. And so, you know, I was always been an artist. When I was 12, after I quit believing in Santa Claus, my parents gave me money to buy whatever I wanted to buy for Christmas. Instead of buying toys, I went out and bought art supplies. My siblings thought I was crazy, but you know, I was just always wanted to be an artist. If you look at my high school yearbook, uh, there was a question, you know, what do you want to be? And I said, I wanted to be a college art professor. And in the end, I ended up being a college art professor. Now that I'm retired and just painting full time, you know, I've kind of, you know, come full circle. Art has always been a part of my life. Thank you. Here you go. See. Mm -hmm. What was the question? No, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I got into art. I've always liked art, but I never knew about it as a profession. Um, our mom used to get us these, like, our kids to let us not be idle, but um, I've always liked art. The profession came about when I was living in Chicago 12 now plus years ago, and um, I was um, banking and I was undergoing duress, and so I started making paintings just to um, relieve myself. And then I was giving them away for free at the time, large pieces. And my coworker was like, if you paint like this, why are you suffering and dealing with banking? And so um, I thought applying like the business knowledge experience that I had um, with my passion like for making um, would turn out okay. Now it was not as okay and, and linear as people might think, but um, it was something I just felt like I enjoyed and wanted to pursue. And then I was just open to seeing where it would take me. So that's how I got into it professionally. Um, where I wanted to go, I just let it happen. I couldn't project that I will have a gallery. 
I just always wanted in the future to have one room in my house that had a bunch of art and books, like what you see in movies with these rich people, and like a center table with a big floral vase. I always wanted that. And now I have like this full gallery where I can come down, be with the art, you'll see flowers around. Some of them are dead, <laughs> some of them are alive. But it's the space that it was meant to be and what I was supposed to be with within this practice. Two more questions. Two more questions. All right, we got time for two more questions. Vitus. Go ahead. Do you want to ask first? All right. Uh, what's your What's your thinking uh, when you uh, when you go through your transitions of like from your first early work to where you are now? What were What were you thinking? And what kind of, What kind of things kind of happened that uh, influenced the way you started making at each each, each stage? Do you repeat the question? You know. The question was, what was I thinking as I transitioned for different aesthetics through my art practice? It's kind of like what happened and also influenced So my very first ones were just like, I'm painting, I have this image, I'm a rendering as a painting, and it was more, I guess, decorative in purpose. In purpose. Um, and then I just started experimenting with materials, so plaster early on. It's like some of the, I have more works, some of it is gone and sold, um, so you can see how random um, my aesthetic was, but it was decorative and I'm just getting out there and making and exploring. And then um, plaster has been like my main staple. I, I consider myself like a hybrid of fine art and industrial materials. Like you'll see me more at a Home Depot, Menards, um, or like some kind of home store like that versus like your Dick Blick or like fine art place. But I do venture to both and use both of those uh, materials. And um, I don't know, as things like enter my mind, like some of my more political pieces, it wasn't like, oh, this is a trend. Let me be, you know, responsive to that or like do what everyone is doing. It's like, oh, I wanted to get this out. One, a piece that's not in here that was sold, my very first like collaging of the different canvases with the plaster as flags. Um, originally it was gonna be responsive to um, Michael Brown and everyone was like doing shows about that. And I couldn't do it, I sat and I couldn't do it because it was too trendy. And it wasn't that I didn't care about the subject matter. It was, it was just like, this is trite. And so it sat for a long time too. And then I ended up making a piece over it about black women who are victims of police brutality instead of just like black males. And then I would do research from that. And then from there, I would just, I work in series. That's another thing. So trying to figure out how I could eventually have a solo show. But again, it would be like things of interest. And so the different bodies of work with me, like, oh, that has plaster in it too. But now I'm experimenting with ink. And usually my stuff is really colorful. So that was my challenge too, was like how to be void of color and accept it. And then again, accept that process. And then the Piccaninnies were just the most happenstance. It was, it's related to the start of this um, building project. I was spray painting the, the grills of um, the burners for um, the commercial, in the commercial kitchen. And it was on, oh, actually that piece right behind is the very first one. Um, and after I picked up the burners from spraying them, I saw these little piccaninny heads and I was like, I don't know what's wrong with me. I don't know why I see these heads, but I'm gonna do something with it. And the way they were gritted, it looked like they were um, mug shots. And so I called it um, When They See Us, like these cartoonish um, criminals, caricatures, ugly, infantile things. And so I just played with that concept. And then I know one of the first um, openings I had for this, for Five Points Art Gallery, a woman, a white woman came in there and she pointed to me and she called me a little girl. She said, oh, that's that little girl, that's that little thing over there. And one of my dear friends from Chicago, she said, what? 
<laughs> little girl. That is a whole woman. <laughs> and she corrected her. So it's just, again, it's a response. Sometimes it's innate. And then, again, I like to work in series, so try to figure out how to expand upon one thing that I made. What's her name? <laughs> Margarita Ann Williams. I the white <laughs> Appreciate that, Marge. Um, Josiah, you had a question? Yeah, my question is, uh, Tina, when you make these pieces, when people come see them, what's, what's one thing that you want people to, when they see them, like, bring out of it? Like, what do you want? Um, so the abstract pieces, I want them to wrestle with abstraction. I know people are like more used of something being directly um, laid out for them, like told like this is this person, like portraiture. Um, and so I want them to wrestle with like a lack of form, uh, formality and form and shape and letting it be like, I'm cool with this. It don't look like nothing to me, but I like it. Cause that's how I approached art when I started getting to it. I was like, I don't know why I like it, but I like it and I'm cool with it. Um, some of my more political please, some of them are satirical to me and I use humor to disarm people so that they can get into it and hopefully the message sinks in like the this is hip hop um, video. It's really talking about appropriation and people came in and they were offended. Black people came in and were offended. Um, actually, some white people were like, I'm embarrassed to be white. I was always, that was the feedback I was getting. So it's about informing and then like letting it sink in like, oh, OK, this is what I'm getting versus like a dead on message like, you're bad, you're doing this. Because people automatically put up arms and get defensive. And it's allowing them to like educate themselves and take away knowledge and hopefully find humanity in other people's situations. Thank you. Um, Libby, you want to be our final question? Yes, yeah, so mine is similar in the fact that it's talking about subjectivity, uh, but like, not to bring up, but you know, you did build this as a 40th birthday, you know, and in honor of that, what does it mean to allow your son to have a solo exhibition? It sounds like there's some tension that you feel with, with, I mean, you made a joke, but jokes always have a pearl of truth. Um, do you feel that you deserve it now? Do you feel like there's enough for a retrospective? Like, can we see other Team Elastic shows that aren't necessarily a retrospective, but a series? Repeat that question, because <laughs> it. So the question, the question was, what's behind my joke about using my 40th birthday to, as a catalyst for this show, and is there more to come? Um, <laughs> I mean, have the 40th not come, I probably would not have done the show. But it was a challenge for me, because the gallery work and working with other artists and for other artists has take a precedence over the, my life over the, like the last six some years. Um, and so I actually shut down the gallery for the, um, January, February so I can make, and I've been making over time, but it has dropped significantly. Like I used to make like 50 to 100 pieces about a year and now it, it dropped to like two, three, 10, 10 if I was lucky. And so this pushed me to make. Um, I know I've gotten some pushback or I would hear rumblings like, Oh, she's not really an artist. I'm like, yeah, I really am. Or am I enough? Um, and then, um, <laughs> <Felt that. laughs> and then um, like, it was a challenge. And I thought, am I really an artist? So let me get out here and make this work. And then I had to balance, like, still managing the gallery, even though it was closed, it was still operating. Um, carving out the time for myself to make these pieces because I had abandoned some of the pieces for so long. Like I hadn't made works like this since 2016. The floral pieces and the abstract show, probably even longer, they were abandoned. Like let myself mess up, explore, reject it, come back um, and work through it. Because there was time I was like, this is some 
bullshit. And then I was like, okay, take a break. And I was trying to force it, and then it, it kind of let me like um, take a break, sleep on it, and then sometimes I get messages while I'm sleeping like, this is how you should approach it. And so um, these are good um, templates for me to expand upon. So I was happy with what I produced, because I'm like, I can see myself making a bunch of renditions of all these different works um, for a while. Similar to what you see with Chuck's work, like he has a whole studio and like walls and bins of his work. That's just a, a few samples. Mom, Patina in here cussing. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we got one more question. Uh, go ahead, Rhonda. Oh, I wanted to, um, can you explain to um, the group what this um, Maggie is for here? <laughs> yeah. I know. I was asked to explain, Chuck and um, Kenyon, you can't see. <laughs> okay, so this piece is, um, it's my piece, but I call it a community piece. So in my area and a lot of neighborhoods around downtown in Milwaukee, we're getting displaced, gentrified, priced out of our homes, and this, I'm subject to it too. Um, prior to moving here, I was living with my grandmother, and I'm like, okay, now I have a place to be stable and steady, but even before I could lay my head down, people were like, I want this building that had been abandoned for 10 some years. And um, a common thing going on is like the tax hikes and all this other stuff, and rent hikes. And then these signs are popping up everywhere. I call them cash for home signs. And they're only primarily on the north side of Milwaukee, which is primarily black. They literally stop at the suburbs. They know better. And so it's targeted. And so my neighbors and I would cut these down. And it got real aggressive. Like, they, as soon as we would cut them down, they would put them up. But we were cutting them down so fast. They slowed for a while. I cut some down yesterday and today, but it's been, like, slower. And so we just compiled these. And it was my idea, like, to do something with it. And this is like a aha. Like, you're wasting your money and your time. And like, look, at we got your signs. And so um, I made it into a, a runner, a rug. And it's supposed to be like a rough rendition of an well, oriental rug. Sorry if that's politically incorrect. Um, or runner. And so some of them are like, the green are like leaves that you might see in an oriental rug, and the pink is like a floral, or a red is like the leaf or um, the petals to it. And so there's a design to it. The red um, zip ties are like the bloodlines in the communities and the aggressiveness behind it. The black zip ties are like the race that's being displaced. And then the fringe are white, and that's the decorative part that actually doesn't hold anything together. But it's told like once they come into this area, they're gonna make it look better. They're bringing the, this folk culture um, that is already existing in these places. So it's a response piece to what is going on now in the area of us trying to of be, us being displaced and priced out of our homes. A <laughs> adjoining piece. So we. I recorded all the phone numbers from here, and over in the corner there, you can call these numbers. <laughs> I know. They're, so it's like intergenerational. There's an old phone and there's a cell phone that's missing, but it, it'll pop back up. But you can call them, and it's directional on how to call these people, and you can tell them, we will not sell, I will not sell, we will not be moved, and all this other stuff. And so both of those, they're response pieces to what's going on. <laughs> Looks like I have a lot of questions, so we can keep going a little longer. Um, Chuck, is there something else you'd like to share about uh, the spirit, the messaging, the purpose behind your work? Well, not really. Um, you know, I just. I really wish I could be there. Um, I don't feel as if I could uh, really participate uh, in the meeting, you know, without having 
been there. But anyway, you know, it, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a great thing. Um, I'm just happy that I was invited to participate in this show. Um, um, I hope people enjoy my work. You know, I know my work is a little bit difficult and a little bit unusual for an African American artist. But you know, I'm glad that some people, you know, can 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 see my vision and appreciate it. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, can you share how people can get in touch with you if they want to commission a work or follow your work and get in touch with you? What's the best way to get in contact with you? Well, you know, just hit me up on Facebook, but, but the, 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 uh, my main platform is Instagram. You can find all of my work on Instagram. I do have a website, chuckjohnsonart.com. It's about three years, years behind. If you want to go back that far, good. But, uh, you know, if you're on Instagram or Facebook, you know, just hit me up on Instagram or Facebook. Thank you. Okay. The last thing about the abstraction show, the, so the purpose of the abstraction show was to highlight artists of color in the, that field because I know when I started making abstract work, um, I was learning that it was considered sellout work. Like black people don't make abstract work, it's only for white people and whatever privilege that they have to do whatever they want. And then I had to do research to learn like, it's a lot of black artists who precede me who was doing it, whose work was stolen and repurposed. Um, and so we actually have a presence in the industry. And so um, that was, that's the main purpose behind the abstraction show is to highlight artists of color who are like forging ahead um, in spite of like being dismissed um, within the industry and being probably more tokenized. Like you should be making political art or whatever they consider your identity art is. And so, um, and then again, looking for diversity. So different genders, identities, backgrounds, histories, ages, who, um, of those people who are, you know, treading the waters in abstraction. And then we're, um, Chuck has more work in the gallery, not just in the exhibition, but in the gift shop too. He has some paper pieces and some smaller renditions of his fragmented pieces as well that you can um, access as well. So that's it. Thank y'all for coming out. Tell me. Go ahead. Thank you, Chuck. Thanks. Thanks. Um, this the both shows are up until April 28th, and then the next show is for the show for the gallery is is third World of Arts Fashion Show. It's called um, Temperatures Rising. Um, based off a of rap song too. <laughs> One of my old models. <laughs> um, and so that's a more body con um, focus. So like bathing suits, um, lingerie, things that people are like, oh, you can't do that in art. And we're like, we're about to do this. And so, um, if and you I'm know. <laughs> so we're always looking for models too, but those are the next shows. And then again, this is up until April 28th. If you want to revisit or send other people and the works will be on the website within like a week, week and a half. Um, so you can purchase or view online as well. All right, can we thank all the artists that are involved? Please make sure you look around and remember the purpose of this gallery is to sell art, not just take pictures next to it. Bye, bye, bye. <laughs>